Welcome to our first ever Corks and Conversation 2 with our friend Al Pesson. Christy, this is very exciting. We talked to Al last season about the same time, um, just at the beginning of his pandemic, of the pandemic, not his pandemic, the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic, when his debut novel, the first in the series, um, Sandblast, came out. Yep, I've got it too. We all can see. <laughs> And um, that was really interesting to, you know, his, all of his plans had changed about his, you know, tour. Um, and now we're still during the pandemic. Um, and now we have his second novel, Blowback, second in the series. And I cannot wait to talk to him today about what this last year has been like for um, writing and publishing and marketing. Ugh. I know, I know. And, um, but of course, as always, before we start grilling him, um, we need to remind our listeners about a little bit about Al's background. Indeed. So Al, is, Al Pesson, so you make sure you get his name for Amazon, is a <laughs> former foreign co- correspondent with more than 15 years overseas in nearly a 40 year journalism career. Um, He started when he was 10. The (laughs) award-winning Task Force Epsilon thriller series grew mainly out of his experiences as a member of the Pentagon Press Corps from 2005 to 2011, including numerous trips to Afghanistan with Secretaries Rumsfeld and Gates and with senior military officers visiting headquarters in Kabul, Kabul, Kabul and several forward operating bases. Um, During that period, he also traveled to Iraq, Pakistan, um, Guantanamo Bay, and many other strategic locales. And if that wasn't enough, Steve Barry, the New York Times bestselling author has said, if your thing is adventure, political intrigue, suspense, and action galore, then this is the thriller for you. Don't wait, check it out now, which we totally agree with. So Al, it is so good to see you today. Well, it's great to be back with you guys. And I didn't realize I was the first to have a second Corks in Conversation. I'm, you are. I'm humbled and honored <laughs> this is, yes. and looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So before we get started with all the big questions, Kathy, um, why don't you tell us about what we're drinking today? I will. Um, it was Al's choice, and um, it is uh, what Al calls his favorite easy drinking wine, and it's Casal Garcia Vinho Verde from Portugal, and it has got a beautiful label. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what Al we had the last time. It's Remember, Kathy? Well, Kathy I didn't. Know. I can't get it around here, unfortunately. But that, that's what we had um, on his course in conversation one. Al and I did. Oh, really? Yes. So, Al, I, this is kind of your go-to. Like, this is what's in your pantry for wine most of the time? Actually, I, I only usually only buy it in the summer. It's a really light wine, and you always serve it really cold. It has a little bit of a fizz to it, and it's very hard for me to drink less than a full bottle of it. So I don't keep it around all the time, but I did happen to see it the other day. And so I grabbed a couple of bottles. It's, it's not fancy. It's under $10. That's I call coming. it, I call it the seven up of wines. You just, just drink. It was, it, it was tasty. I remember it. I yeah. think I got it at total wine. And, yeah. um, the seven and, up of wine. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, it was, it was tasty. I need to, I need to stock up on that as well. <laughs> Well, let's all have a cheers to Al and Blowback publication. Cheers to you guys. Cheers to you. It's so great to see you again, Al. Yep. You know, we should, I remember we met Al at Slipfest. Uh, That's when I met Al. I don't know if that's when you met Al, Christy. Around that time. Maybe at a meeting before that. Yeah, but otherwise probably at Sleuth Fest. They're Florida yeah. That's when I got to know him better. <laughs> yeah, and then the second year I had seen you at Sleuth Fest, you had let us know that you'd gotten a book contract for this series. Yeah. Was that at Sleuth Fest or Thriller Fest? No, I remember exactly. It was in the oh, okay. hallway by the atrium by the elevators. And I was so thrilled for you. And you had given <laughs> me a card. I had Kensington on there. Yep. And I thought that was such a, 
amazing progress in a year. You know? I know. I, I was, well, yeah. I mean, the journey hadn't started at, at, when I first met you. It had started sometime before that, but, but it yeah. was a good year for me. And then I did see you guys at Thriller Fest as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then everything went uh, virtual. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that was, wow. it was a, we had a lot of fun at Thriller Fest. Yes, we did. Yeah. And um, great conversation. So here we are today. Yep. And so I'm going to start out first and foremost with the questions because um, I just want to know what happened, what your year has been like after your debu debut novel, Sandblast, came out. I mean, I know that things have been different because um, of the pandemic, but I'm still curious on how you handle promotion, writing, editing, the next book, whatever you want to talk about, because we are just so curious uh you know we we're curious on a normal year on that whole first year but now we've got somebody who's also doing it through the pandemic so you know what can you tell us well you know the, the first thing to remember is that sandblast's launch date was march 31st last year so that was two weeks after all the bookstores closed and most of the other stores closed and my launch event, which was supposed to be at our local bookstore here, Murder on the Beach, was canceled. And I had to put together an online launch event, which now is totally normal, but at that time was completely unusual. So unusual that it got mentioned in the South Florida Sun Sentinel, like <laughs> wow. as part of a larger article about how the pandemic was affecting authors and other uh, professionals. So. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of, whoa. And now I'm launching a second book in the pandemic. We're still in the yeah. pandemic I know. and I'm doing a Zoom launch event, uh, but it, you know, it's perfectly normal, but it's still obviously not as satisfying as uh, doing an in-person event or as, as going to the conferences, like where I met you guys. I mean, I'm, right. I'm hoping to get back to conferences late this summer, maybe in the fall, Florida Writers Association. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. but yeah, we're, we're sort of, Wait, well, to so that would be so it. nice to sit there and be able to sign your book. Yeah. I mean, that's I've just the, that. you, I've never I know. done that at a bookstore and that's so or a concert. Sad. Yeah. So maybe later this year, I hope so. Do you, um, do, do you other, sign a lot of books to, to mail to people? Some, like? I, to mail and, and of course, family and friends or people that I encounter mm -hmm. in person, some a couple of neighbors. Um, but yeah, not, not really the general public. But, you know, the other interesting thing about a couple things about the uh, pandemic is that I think a lot of people felt the malaise. You know, you were sitting home, one day was like another, and I actually got way behind on my third book, which uh, had a deadline. And so over the summer, I was really bad about writing, and I had to really buckle down in the fall, and I did make the deadline. But that was, a, that was a writer's malaise that I've heard a lot of writers felt. Mm -hmm. And the other oh, thing was that, uh, you know, Blowback uh, was uh, submitted to the publisher January 15th of last year. And I didn't really appreciate how much their lives were blown up by the pandemic uh, starting, you know, uh, about six or seven weeks later. Uh, because all of a sudden at Kensington Publishing, they weren't going into the office. People were working from home who had never done it before. Computers had to be bought. Software had to be bought. People had to learn a new routine, a new discipline about how to get work done at home. And the result was that I didn't get the editor's return on blowback for four months, February, March, April, May, four months. Wow. And I got it actually the day before it was due in final form. So of course I had to extend that deadline oh. by a couple of weeks, but a process that should have involved going back and forth a couple of times over four months was delayed for four months and compressed to two weeks. But wow. now of course they're, they're much better at dealing yeah. with the dislocation, but, but it just kind of hit right at the wrong time. And as you know, when you're busy and you get behind and the new work keeps coming in and things just piled up on folks. Yeah. You know, you really well, got Kathy, it. I have to tell him that mm -hmm. you have called it the COVID coma, that mm -hmm. whole that mm -hmm. malaise. Yeah. She's got a good term for it. Yeah. Well, it, it's been, a, it's, it's been, um, 
you know, I, I think it affects, I've never met anyone that hasn't been affected by in some way in their life, but I think it affects people in such different times or in different ways. And so you, you know, you just, um, yeah, that's what I'm calling it is the COVID coma. Cause I just don't feel as clear-minded or as creative as I, and right. I think stress, I think that getting used to mm -hmm. abject, unknown, stressful situations on a daily basis, um, probably similar to what you've seen overseas as a war correspondent, honestly, when, you know, for those yeah, folks. In a way, are... yeah, in a way. And, and I, I just think that the Groundhog Day phenomenon uh, really has, mm -hmm. has an impact. And, and also the fact that you don't have to discipline yourself to sort of have a shower and get dressed and get out of the house at a certain time. You can just sit around in your PJs and have a third cup of coffee and, oh my gosh, it's 11 o'clock, what's for lunch? And nothing has gotten done. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it affected uh, a lot of people, writers and I suppose editors included. Yeah, yes. And, and go ahead, Kathy, did no, you have a question? Um, so I, I, when you were talking about this, so ordinarily um, when you submit your um, first copy to be edited, like you did in January for uh -huh. blowback, but blowback, like, do you know what ordinarily it's usually the turnaround? Are you experiencing that now with the third book or? Yeah, you know, I, I haven't been at this long enough to know what's normal. So as I said, the first one was four months, which I know is not supposed to be that long. And then okay. the third book, Shockwave, came back in uh, like three weeks. Mm. Oh, wow. So and did you have more time then to work on? Well, and now, you know, I mean, we still have the May 15th sort of final, final deadline. Okay. Uh, but, oh, but you definitely uh, have more than one day. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so my job now is to uh, look at the editor's email uh, and incorporate a few changes. And I'm also still waiting to hear back from some of my beta readers. And we can talk about that process if you want. So uh, around the 1st of March, I will start my revisions that'll take a couple of weeks to go through and then i'll get it back to the editor and if she's happy then we're done well in advance of may 15th and if she wants a few more revisions we have plenty of time cool. so al i did have a question for you because i was reading in your acknowledgments here which is mm -hmm. I have a question for you guys do you save the acknowledgments for the end or do you go up because i often go read them first uh, on any book oh in reading no <laughs> yeah. i i Usually I, I read them read afterwards. Them. Yeah. It's like, like the little bit of extra that I I'm like, oh, reason, it's done. Now I get to read the acknowledgement. I read yours first. And I'm not sure if I just because I know you and I was so curious about how what the process is like. But you really outline how many people you let see your book at, at certain points. Your wife, I think you said, is your first. And, um, and then you have a professional editor that you work with and a critique group and beta readers. So obviously. Right. You have one, you have a wonderful group of, of a community trusted really. readers. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering how you develop that, how it's how you use it, why it's so important. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's it's important because you know, writing is a very solitary endeavor. And I am a firm believer that whatever happens to fly off my finger uh, fingertips onto the keyboard is is not the be all and end all. And, you know, as you mentioned, I had a long career in journalism. Part of that time I was an editor. So I've seen it from both sides. And, you know, you just need uh, as many extra sets of trusted eyes on it as you can have. And, and you need to take each person's comments seriously. You don't necessarily do what everybody says mm -hmm. to do, but uh, you sort of all take it on board and it all become sort of part of the process of that next draft as you as you go through it. So the different groups that I have, as you mentioned, there's a friends and family group, there's my critique group, uh, who are writers in different genres, not thriller writers. And then the beta readers are really important. And these are my military friends, my journalist friends, my government friends. In this, in the case of blowback, I had a psychiatrist friend who had also worked with uh, PTSD through the military. Oh. So he was a perfect person to read, especially that first part of the book, mm -hmm. uh, 
that involves PTSD without giving any spoilers. So, so mm -hmm. you know, no writer, even though, I mean, of course your first defense, if somebody says you got something wrong, your first defense is it's fiction, but you don't want to get anything too horribly wrong or stupidly wrong or something you could have gotten right, might've even improved the story. So, you know, you do try to, uh, I try to have some expert beta readers and because of my previous career, I know a lot of people who are experts in these fields and they've been very generous with reading the books and sending me, uh, you know, just an email critique. It's not a line by line thing and yeah. it's very useful. And do they, do, I mean, do they do this in a timely manner for you or do you say, I need it by this date or? or... Yeah, um, you know, I usually ask people to get back to, I, well, first of all, I ask them if they can do it. Yeah. Right, and, of course. And when I ask, I say, you know, within a, could you do it within about a month? Okay. And if they say, I really can't, then fine. And if they say yes, then I send them the manuscript. And if I haven't heard back in a month or so, I send them a gentle reminder. And, you know, most people are pretty good about uh, coming back to me with, uh, with their critiques. So are you, are you working on something else during that month? Are you just, um, you know, do you send them all out kind of the same time, hoping to get them all back? You know, honestly, pre in the previous two books, the beta readers saw it and I did my revisions based on their suggestions before I sent the first submitted draft to the publisher. Mm. But this year, because of the COVID malaise and because I barely made my deadline, I didn't have time to send it to the beta readers mm -hmm. first. So the publisher and the beta readers got it at the same time. And hmm. so that now I'm going to take the ed publishers. Oh, you're going to have like all these spreadsheets. Exactly. All <laughs> the whatever. comments. And then I'm going to go through it again, starting around the 1st of March. So I think the result will be the same, uh, but the uh, sequence was different and, you know, blame it on the Corona. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You know what, I Kathy, know. I think. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I think we're time for our. Um... Yeah. So, Al, I don't know if you remember, probably not riveting in your mind since we all had the <laughs> coma, uh, COVID coma. Um, but we ask our authors that we talk to a question in the bottle, kind of midway in our conversation. Mm. You okay. can pass if you don't like the question, but no pressure, no one has yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, this is a nice one. Okay. Oh, good. We need that. Yeah. Which What's host the most... of Game of Books do you like better? Oh, <laughs> yes. What? Oh, we are going to save that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the most beautiful place you've ever seen? Ooh. It's a hard oh, one. You nice. might have more than one answer, but it is Golly. it is a nice one. Golly, there it, there is a road in a place called Azad Kashmir. Azad Kashmir is the small Pakistani part of Kashmir, which most of Kashmir is a northern state of India, and part of it is controlled by Pakistan. And I went there one time, and it was this sort of windy road, and you came to a point where you're on the top of the mountain, and you can see the river below, where one of those where the river comes around and makes a full loop, a full 180, and, and that was one of the greatest views I ever saw. Wow. We, and I bet not a lot of people, not a lot of Americans for sure have seen it. That's No, it's, it's a very difficult place to get to and difficult to get permission to go there, at least at that time, many years right. ago. Right. Wow. I imagine it's not easy even now. I'm pretty well, sure I hope to grade your answer, but that's probably an A plus answer, I'd say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, that oh my the first gosh. one to mention Azad Kashmir. I believe yeah. you are. <laughs> And normally Kathy and I are like, we want to go there. And I'm like, yeah. I would like to go there, but now I'm like, not sure that's going to be feasible, at least <laughs> not in the near future, but you never know. Someday. Maybe. Right. Someday. Someday. All right. So listen, this, let's talk about the actual book, right? Okay. Let's talk about blowback. Um, this, um, the second one in the series, it's the task force epsilon series. And um your op or I'm um, sorry, your um, intelligence officer, Bridget Davenport, who's a very, very impressive and interesting character. 
Um, I can't wait to follow her path in the next book. I just love I know. her. And her operative, help me make sure I'm pronouncing this right, Faraz, right? It's Faraz yes, Abdullah. correct. Abdallah? Abdallah. And they're working out of Syria this time. He's in Syria. Yeah. She's in Iraq. Yeah. Supervising working. as best she can. Yeah. Working in a situation in Syria. And I, you obviously have, as we talked about, your, your travels and your previous work have colored this. Um, but I, I mean, it's been a while, I imagine, since you've been overseas. Mm -hmm. it Talk is about nice. research. Talk about how did you re refresh your memory? Well, you know, I was, I'm still certainly in, uh, in blowback. And yeah, in the third book, uh, Shockwave as well. Uh, I'm relying a lot on uh, memories of my own experiences. I mean, I have not been to Syria but I have been to Iraq and I've been to the headquarters in Baghdad where Bridget spends much of the book. Uh, and of course I've met a lot of Afghans and a lot of US troops and I'm always sort of amalgamating characters out of folks that I remember. So there is some research about uh, geography, about weapons. Um, I'm using Google Translate a lot to mm. come up with little bits of Arabic or other languages that I want to throw into the books. So, um, so there is some research involved. And in fact, I hope the FBI does not monitor my Google searches for, <laughs> for Arabic phrases and bomb making and quotes from the Quran and, you know, geography of this place and that place. And, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it, it, I'm sure it would not look good to an investigator. You know, right. I, Al, I remember um, looking on your website last year and you had a lot of photos from your travels, mm -hmm. especially like Saddam Hussein's palace and right. some, so are those still on your website? People can they take are. a look at? They are still there. You, uh, you gotta go check these out. Cause first of all, you'll realize how impressive Al's career is because when, right. when I first met Al, we're talking about your career and at Thriller Fest and we're like, Kathy and I are like slurring I politics. We're like, yeah, we don't like this. And Al's like probably sitting there going, these girls have no idea. Uh, I don't yeah. remember it that way. Yeah, well, good. I'm well, glad. that's good. But, but we were, you know, I do remember a little bit. I was like, and then later when I read your book, I was like, oh my gosh, he was probably like going. <laughs> <laughs> no, but readers need to go and see some of these sites. He's got firsthand photos on there and it's, it's pretty great. Yeah. 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 It was, it was a fun ride doing that stuff. Yeah. So, um, so I, and, and again, we want to jump into blowback, the specifics, but not giving anything away. No, and yeah. I, no you know, I got to tell you, um, I just love, we just love the, how you handle these complex government systems and politics. And then also it's a high paced thriller, you know, and I'm not exaggerating. Am I, Kathy, when I say that it's reminiscent of like Tom Clancy or no, Robert no. Ludlum? I mean, really, we're not, we're not just blowing smoke, right? <laughs> Al is our friend, disclaimer, we're just saying. He is our friend, but I'm <laughs> well, serious, nice. you know. Nice I mean, you could stuff. give it to anybody and they'd think the same thing. And, um, and so as readers, we're drawn to these characters and we want to follow them, you know, like Jason Bourne or whatever. And um, so we want to know what your plans and hopes are for this series. I mean, we know we've talked a little bit. We know that there's another one coming out. So what are you hoping or planning or what's going on? Well, uh, book three, Shockwave, uh, has been submitted, has been approved. Generally speaking, there'll be a few revisions. And so that's in the pipeline for about a year from now. So please put me back on your calendar. I'll be... <laughs> Corks in conversation number three. Three. Um, <laughs> Roman numeral three. <laughs> and after that, I'm not sure. There are certainly some more adventures they could go on. I just have to fall back on the tried and true phrase, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. All right. Well, we know whatever you're writing, we're going to want to read. I'm telling oh, you, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Good you stuff. You know, Al, you're too... I don't know if you would say you're two protagonists in my mind. I feel like you have mm -hmm. two lead characters. Absolutely. Okay. And so one is Bridget Davenport and then the other is Faraz. Mm -hmm. And they both have such challenging 
lives <laughs> coloring their experience in this challenging world. Do you want to talk about some of the motivations and where you got those characters? You know, one of the goals when I first sat down to write Sandblast uh, was to illuminate a few things for the average reader, the average person who doesn't follow uh, national security affairs as closely as I once did. And a couple of those things are, number one, the, the difficulty and the uncertainty of war. Both, it's much more difficult and much more uncertain than most people think. And people say, oh, you know, send the Marines, send the troops, send more troops, bring the troops home, uh, without really thinking about what the goals are, what the possibilities are, what it would cost to achieve the goals. And then the other factor is about the people, because such a small segment of the US population is in the military these days because we have the all volunteer force. Mm -hmm. So these are wonderful people and, and we're all grateful that they volunteer, but it does create this sort of division in the society. And a lot of Americans don't really understand what's being asked of those folks and how much they do in terms of the physical danger that they face, the skills they possess and the physical and psychological wounds that they come home with. So if I can show that through fiction without requiring somebody to read the newspaper every day or, or watch the TV news about the wars of which there's very little anyway these days, um, if I can tell that truth or those truths through fiction, then, then I feel good about that. And I think you did. Yeah, the, the, I think the, the um, can't give any spoilers, but the rawness of the toll that um, the work that Faraz has done is, uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's very powerful. And, mm -hmm. and uh, well, I, it's yeah, interesting just... you say that, Kathy, because I can't wait now for you to read the final words of Shockwave in which they talk, I try not, I'm trying to say this without spoilers, but those final like, words talk about the cost. Mm -hmm. it, and I, I think, you know, we see it in almost all of your characters. We see a different kind of cost for each of them, a different level, but they all are dealing with the result of war and the result of sacrifice and you know how it affects their entire lives you know and how it affects our adversaries as well i try yes. to fix that yeah but hey this has gotten very heavy <gasps> drink some wine and, it is yeah and i want to ask you guys can i ask you guys a question of course uh we didn't mention that in blowback unlike in sandblast there is some love Yes, there is some love. Al. Love, love blossoms. <laughs> almost a, almost a love triangle in, in the midst of of war. I uh, well, yeah. oh, there's, you, yeah, there's love on a lot of levels now. I'm yeah. just remembering, yeah, the other. Yeah. Oh, there's gosh. romantic love, but there is also some, fam you know, familial. I really I, love love. Yeah, <laughs> it was just Valentine's Day. Yeah, love, love. Is that a <laughs> hey, look, love? <laughs> yeah. How did you? How did you enjoy my Valentine's? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> my daughter you, put those up okay um did you find did you find those scenes harder to write than an action scene when you're chasing someone down yeah well and if you notice i sort of copped out on the two, <laughs> yes, the I two did. sort of love scenes is just like yeah and then they made love and then it's the next <laughs> scene. uh you know it's, 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 not a, it's not a bodice ripper uh right and, and i think in all seriousness, you do have to calibrate uh, how explicit uh, you want to be based on, on what you're trying to convey and what the genre is and who the readers are. And yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's not explicit, but uh, in terms of the sex, it's not explicit, but there is definitely love. Uh, both of the main characters, you know, are sort of right. have love situations and deal with, uh, love conflict and lost mm -hmm. love and uh so yeah it's not it's not all bang bang no but it's also not i agree know, the the you know the idea that you would like people to have an awareness of what um 
our soldiers go through is not foremost in the read by any means. Action adventure that I could not wait to get back to. I'm not like Christy, I'm not a complete night owl, so I fall asleep, but one of the first things I'd think about the next morning is, when can I find time today to get this read? And I got it read in two, two and a half days. Wow. wow. I, I mean, I, I get it read in that, but yeah. that's because I'm, you know, a night owl. I'm not a night owl. I'm actually an insomniac, but, um, but, you know, Kathy, you're a, you're a fast reader. Girl. I, I am a fast reader, but I, I think Alan, we had communicated last week and it, and it came in the mail and I started that night and I woke up early the next morning and I had time slot. So I read then and I, I just kind of kept prioritizing yeah. Al. So kudos it's a great read i love yep. you guys you're like my biggest fan we are your biggest <laughs> <We> are. fan <laughs> okay so hey listen i i really think we should ask al we we had, did get a yes. little bit heavy because of our environment but we, but we have we have light things no i wanted to ask what the highs were of the year al oh <laughs> the highs were uh becoming a grandfather <gasps> oh congratulations yeah and uh you know, and then uh, I don't know. That's that's a that's a pretty big high. That's you know? a pretty yeah. big high. Yeah, that's a really good high. You know, especially during COVID. That's just like okay, the world is not as crazy no. because we're still Things moving on. That's right. That's and right. taking your writing companion, your dog, to the beach always looked fun when I'd see that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, and I thought Kathy was going to go with our, our, our final question, which is yours, Christy. Yeah. Which is our, our new question for Quarks and Conversation dose Uh episode. Um, (laughs) So, cause you know, we didn't want to give the same question we gave you at the end of um, that we give you on the end of our normal Quarks and Conversation. So we varied it up a little, you know, still going with the foodie aspect, but here's the question. If you had to choose one of your characters to be your personal chef, who would you choose and why? <laughs> mm, to be my personal chef. Um, you know, it might have to be Faraz because we're not aware if Bridget is much of a cook. She's <laughs> right. in the military and yeah. she's very dedicated to her career. I see her more as a, as a takeout food kind of woman. <laughs> uh, and I don't know for sure, and maybe I should clarify this at some point in the books, I don't know for sure if Faraz learned any Afghan cooking from his mother, but if he did, I am all over it because Afghan food is fabulous. In fact, in Sandblast, I say that his favorite uh, Afghan dish is actually my favorite Afghan dish, which is called Kabuli Palau, which is a big, big pile of rice with meat and raisins and nuts and spices inside. Oh yeah. So if he could if he could do even a halfway decent version of that, he'd be my cook. That's so funny because I was thinking, how is Al gonna answer this? And I said, <laughs> I would go with Faraz because I feel like he loved his mom. He probably and you know he's just like sort of that nurturing type that he would learn how to cook. Yeah. And he would do a good job of it. That's kind of how I feel. Uh, yeah. And that uh, sounds delicious. And he's delicious. an only child. So, you know, maybe yeah. he, he got some of that time that a sister would have gotten in terms of right. the kitchen time. Right, right. Okay, well, so Alex, our listeners and your readers are going to want to go to your website and follow your social media. So what's their best way to find you? Alpesson.com. A-L-P-E-S-S-I-N.com. There are links there for my social media feeds. I'm on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can also email me through the website by clicking on Contact Al. And you can subscribe to my newsletter, which comes out every two or three months or whenever I get around to it. So yeah. <laughs> it won't clog up your inbox, but you'll also uh, find out when books are coming out and other things that are happening. And Few pictures of my dog and uh, grandson. Great. I'm a subscriber. I, I will say he doesn't clog, but when when he shows up in my inbox, I'm very happy to hear from him. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Kat. Yeah. So, Al, uh, it's been it's been a pleasure, and I think at this point we just have to cheer the second book and cheers to many back. more 
you just yeah, gotta, you, you gotta pour some more. I finished my glass, so I have to. Uh, I know. I, I just I just surreptitiously pour. poured mine so that I could. <laughs> Cheers! Cheers, Al. Congratulations! Cheers. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.